You have to be able to imagine a different future than the one that we're living in. With a clear focus on transforming things, whether you like it or not. We showed it could be done. That is a big deal. You have to push the boundaries. If you're not taking enough risk, you don't belong in DARPA. The Soviet bloc and U.S. with NATO in a conflict where you had some individuals like Khrushchev who would say things like, we will bury you. The people actually thought nuclear exchanges were likely or possible. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. The Soviet Union launched a little ball called Sputnik. And that little ball uh, went around the Earth with little beeps. It went around beep, beep, beep. And some people might say, well, so what? Well, the point is that that said something else. It said, we can hit you, we can hit you, we can hit you. America's first attempt to launch a satellite is already unhappy history. Another setback for the United States. I think the United States, it's fair to say, was very surprised that the Russians beat us into space. Dwight Eisenhower, 1958, created uh, ARPA at the time. The D was added later to be DARPA. I shall propose a program of action, a program that will demand the energetic support of not just the government, but every American, if we are to make it successful. DARPA was set up to maintain a technological vigil for the country and to make sure that we weren't surprised again. The original ARPA had three separate missions, one which was an immediate success of being transitioned over to create NASA. They had missile defense, and then there was the nuclear test detection program, which they developed the seismic capabilities for and the space-based satellite capabilities for. Well, missile defense is a big problem, a difficult problem, even today. Back then, it was a massively daunting problem. The reason is simple. We didn't know how missiles behaved in space. We didn't know what they looked like coming into the atmosphere. Plans call for a series of advanced airborne detectors and logic systems to be placed into orbit to continually improve our nation's ability to detect nuclear bursts in deep space. DARPA's expertise and development of things like Vela, being able to detect a nuclear blast in the atmosphere, and then the seismology work that came later to detect underground explosions, very much allowed our policymakers to develop these treaties and to have that capability to trust but verify. This nation now possesses a variety of techniques to detect the nuclear tests of other nations, which our modern instruments can pick up. We like to say we had a huge role in the beginnings of the internet. Back in the 60s, JCR Licklider came to DARPA to run the Information Processing Techniques Office. And this is obviously going to make a tremendous difference in how we plan, organize, and execute almost everything of any intellectual consequence. Lick had a concept that he had written about, which he called man-machine symbiosis how computers can make man more creative. What a astounding vision. It's just fundamental that if one wants to deal with information, he ought to deal with the information and not with the paper it's written on. When he talked about networking, he saw it as a way for people to communicate, people to interact with machines. The only problem was computers didn't connect to each other in any way at that time. And DARPA wanted someone to build a four-node network. And I looked at it and said, I think I know how to do that. And then in the spring of 73, Bob shows up in my lab, and he and I together destroyed the ARPANET on a regular basis using artificially generated traffic to show that the protocols had problems. 
By January 1 of 1983, all but two machines had successfully implemented TCP IP. So the birth of the operational internet, from my point of view, comes January 1, 1983. Other than the handful of us that were working on it, nobody else thought this was going to amount to very much, and look what happened. It's been said that a war in Central Europe will be decided within the first five days. DARPA was asked, is there another way to defend Europe from a Soviet invasion uh, besides using nuclear weapons? The Soviet Union became checkmated by this set of programs, the Assault Breaker Program, which was an integrated weapons capability, the penetrating aircraft that couldn't be seen. All of this became major new thrusts that subsequently became the heart of DARPA for the next 20 years. All of these capabilities demonstrated a fundamental shift in technological capabilities in the use of warfare that basically said to any adversary, if you want to use conventional warfare, please go ahead and try, because we can eradicate your capabilities with great prejudice to you. Uh, latest report, aircraft via fly six miles southeast of the White House. Six miles southeast of the White House? Yep. And I said to the, guy, the people in the staff, I say, what, do anybody know what's going on here? I just got another, uh, uh, you know, about the plane. And my secretary was going like this to me. She couldn't even talk. And she pointed out the window, and we looked towards the Pentagon, and there was black smoke. And uh, this is Gopher 06. It looks like that aircraft crashed into the Pentagon, sir. Nine eleven was a seminal event in our country, no question about it. It really brought home the idea that our homeland could be attacked. So what could we do? DARPA was leading the way with things that the Department of Defense didn't know they needed. It's that transformative nature that keeps us technologically superior to the adversaries to help maintain that security of the United States of America. Sigma was a program that I created several years ago to look at ways to continuously monitor our city, the region scale areas for radiological and nuclear threats. And so the program was successful at developing some very high capability sensors at low cost. We just started a Sigma Plus program, which is trying to build the chemical and the bio into that radiological sensor. Very hard thing to do. If we're successful there, I, I, will, I will sleep much better at night. I think the 21st century warfare is going to really be about speed. Who can move faster? Who can understand information faster? Who can take advantage of that information faster than the other guy? Thinking about multiple domains simultaneously, the cyber domain, the information domain, the space domain, the ground. These mid-teen years, uh, will, in retrospect, turn out to be the beginning of the sparks that really lead to the next set of capabilities. Ready? Ready. Game started at 0945 seconds Pacific. So the Cyber Grand Challenge culminated in a competition among seven finalists at uh, the DEF CON conference in which you have to defend your own computer against attack while trying to attack other computers. What we learned from this is cybersecurity in the 21st century is gonna, gonna be seconds and minutes, not hours, days, months. Artificial intelligence is gonna be a, a key player there. And at 2005, we did an assessment on military personnel coming back from the conflicts in the Middle East or living with limb loss. When it came to the upper extremity, the choices were few and far between. Jeff Ling was a program manager at DARPA. He was also an army doctor. And when he served during Iraq and Afghanistan, he saw firsthand the signature injuries of these wars. He came back 
to DARPA convinced that we had to come up with better upper limb prosthetics. The simple hook that had been the standard of care for decades simply wasn't adequate uh, for what they had sacrificed. So we said, all right, let's use the DARPA approach. Let's do something drastically different. Let's develop the world's most advanced prosthetic arm. We went from this impossible challenge of developing an arm, and then you can see that arm, you know, only a handful of years later on a person that could really benefit from that. It gives you kind of chills uh, thinking about uh, being able to cross all of that in such a short period of time. And this is so nice. One of the biology programs I'm most excited about is the Pandemic Prevention Platform Program, or P3. This is a program that is trying to develop a vaccine and have it scaled up for a large population, say 20,000 people, in 60 days or less. About five years ago, there was a new capability called genome editing that gave us, for the first time, the ability to actually manipulate DNA. How can we pursue these technologies for good, but at the same time be wary of how they could potentially be misused, either accidentally or in a nefarious way? What's happening today in the social sciences allows us now to start asking and answering questions that we haven't been able to grapple with in the past questions about human behavior, questions about societal behavior. And it's hard to think of anything that's more fundamental to the business of national security than understanding people. So my job as an anthropologist at DARPA is to understand human belief systems, values, identities, and what they say about not only where we are now, but, but how we might have a better design for going forward. How we might actually take control, as it were, of our own futures in a better world where ultimately national security is about avoiding conflict as much as actually winning it when it occurs. What we do for people is we show it can be done. We do the existence proof and it is amazing. This is the place where science fiction becomes reality. And if you go and you read the guys who wrote science fiction, these are the fantastic inventors. I mean, they were inventors in the conceptual stuff. And they took a few facts here and there and they created a, a story out of it. And that's what DARPA does. We take a few facts here and we say, holy Christ, we can do this now. It's that urgency. It's that, that, that fire and that drive to make the impossible possible that makes this uh, place so unique but don't hire anybody that doesn't have a bee in his or her bonnet to, that wants to get something done, willing to take risks, prepared to take risks, and is allowed to take risks. In fact, if you're not taking enough risk, you don't belong in DARPA. If you're a problem solver, this is the place for you. And I can't think of a better problem to solve than trying to keep our country safe.